Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The techniques and procedures of periodontal examination will be demonstrated on this 32-year-old graduate student from India. For the past several years, he has noticed that his gums bleed when he brushes his teeth. His general health is excellent. For clarity, the examination procedures will only be demonstrated in those areas of the mouth which can best be shown. Cheek retractors are used to facilitate the photography. The examination of the periodontal structure should begin with a survey of the gingiva for surface lesions. Although the examination should extend from third molar to third molar, this demonstration will be limited to the anterior region. The gingival tissue should be gently dried with a gauze sponge. This will facilitate accurate appraisal of gingival color. Various red and purplish hues can be observed, particularly in the mandibular region. Note the form of the free gingiva, including the interproximal areas and the attached gingiva. The density of the gingiva is tested with the side of a University of Michigan Zero probe. The thickened free margins are swollen and soft. The density of the attached gingiva also should be tested. Here, the density in the maxilla is normal, while in the mandible, the attached gingiva is softer. The handle of the probe is pressed lightly on the free gingiva and the interdental papillae to elicit any pus or provoke any bleeding. As the tissue is compressed, some pus can be seen between the upper central and lateral incisors and some between the lower incisors. A number zero probe is used to determine the relationship between the free gingival margin and the cemento enamel junction. On tooth number nine, the free gingival margin is on enamel, and the cemento enamel junction is easily located with the probe. On the mandibular lateral incisor, the cemento enamel junction is exposed. The distance from the free gum margin and the cemento enamel junction, representing the gingival recession, is measured and can be recorded. The depth of the gingival sulci, or periodontal pockets, is measured by inserting the number zero probe into the sulcus, or pocket, in the direction of the long axis of the tooth, mesially, labially, and distally. Calculus obscures the cemento-enamel junction of the lower anterior incisors. The calculus must be removed before accurate measurements can be obtained. This is being done on one of the incisors. The distances from the cemento enamel junction to the free gingival margin can now be accurately measured. Periodontal pockets should be explored for depth and for possible bi- and trifurcation involvement. The number 17 explorer
neighbor's probes, or number three explorers are useful for this purpose. The crowns of the teeth are also examined for occlusal wear and facet patterns. Dual facet patterns may indicate a combination of functional and dysfunctional wear. Malformations of the teeth, including hypoplasia or mottled enamel, should be noted. The amount of plaque can be estimated by drawing a probe across the surface of the tooth. Special attention must be paid to the amount of plaque that contacts the gingival margin. Suprogingival calculus is frequently found on the buccal aspect of the maxillary molars. Note the soft debris on the surface of the calculus. This area has obviously been completely missed by the patient's toothbrush. Subgingival calculus can be observed when the free gingiva is deflected or it may be felt by a straight probe. The number 17 explorer is used to test for carious lesions, calculus, and surface roughness. Temporary fillings, as observed in this mandibular molar, should be examined and recorded. Subgingival calculus and cavities should be explored from the lingual as well as from the buccal aspect. Note any irregular position of the teeth. Here, the maxillary first molar has extruded as a result of the loss of the opposing tooth. Also note the mesial inclination of the second mandibular molar. Observe irregular marginal ridge relationships, as seen here, associated with extrusion of the first maxillary molar. The buccal lingual widths of the interproximal contact areas are examined to see if they afford sufficient protection of the interdental papillae. The presence of open contacts is determined and the quality of interproximal contacts tested with dental floss or tape. The mobility of the teeth should be checked by pushing an instrument against the buccal aspect while holding a finger against the lingual aspect of the tooth. Here, the mandibular incisors demonstrate slightly increased mobility beyond the normal limits. The handle of an instrument is used for percussion of the teeth. Teeth in trauma from occlusion often have a duller than normal percussion sound. Vitality is tested if there is some reason to suspect a tooth's normal vitality. An electric testing device and toothpaste for conduction of the electric current are used. The amount of overbite and overjet are measured with a number zero probe. The 
patient is then asked to perform mandibular movements in various directions with the teeth maintaining occlusal contacts. In this case, the obviously interfering molars do not allow for smooth gliding movements and functional contacts are lost in the anterior region when eccentric excursions are performed. The finger is used to lightly palpate the maxillary teeth while the patient taps together in centric occlusion. Any horizontal impact on the teeth should be noted. Individual teeth should be lightly palpated while the patient attempts to perform eccentric excursions with maintained occlusal contacts to feel if any of the teeth are being bounced during such movements. The technique for a complete examination of the occlusion is demonstrated in a separate film. Disclosing solution is applied first to the mandibular teeth and then to the maxillary teeth. When applied in this order, there is less dilution of the stain with saliva. After rinsing with water, the distribution of plaque, debris, and calculus becomes very obvious to the examiner and the patient. The plaque is confined mainly to the interproximal areas and the exposed root surfaces. Dental radiographs are indispensable in periodontal examination. A set of 14 periapical and four posterior bite wing radiographs should be available if the patient has a fairly complete dentition. A methodical approach to radiographic viewing is highly desirable. The examination should begin with the periapical radiograph of the maxillary molars on the right side and follow this sequence for viewing. The lamina dura and cortical bone should be examined for continuity and thickness over the alveolar crest and around the roots of all teeth. The periodontal space should be examined for variations in width. The level of the alveolar crest should be related to the cemento enamel junction and to bi and trifurcations. The root shape and crown root ratio should be studied. Periapical pathologic changes should be noted, as well as any pathologic conditions related to the teeth. This includes calculus and caries. Pathologic conditions of the jaws should be looked for. The lamina dura and the width of the periodontal space appear to be normal. There has been some lowering of the alveolar crest. The roots appear to be fused to a cone shape. The crown root ratio is normal. No periapical changes are evident, but there is an occlusal metal filling and spurs of calculus on the interproximal surfaces. The trabecular pattern of the bone is normal. A similar statement can be made for the second molar. At the mesial aspect of the first molar, there is evidence of bone resorption extending into the trifurcation. Similar examination should be performed for all of the periapical radiographs. Notice the advanced bone loss in the radiographs of the mandibular incisors. Almost two-thirds of the bone support has been lost around these teeth. Also note the heavy deposits of calculus. The posterior bite wings should be examined with regard to lamina dura, position and quality of the alveolar crest, condition of bi and trifurcations, contour and fit of restorations, pulp size and morphology, calculus, coronal shape, and curious lesions. In this instance, the lamina dura appears fairly normal in thickness between the upper, second, and third molars. but. The interproximal alveolar crest is concave instead of the normal convex appearance.
the level of the alveolar crest is two millimeters apical from the cemento enamel junction instead of the normal distance of one to 1.5 millimeters. No defect is seen in the restoration of the third molar and the pulp is of normal size and morphology. There are small spurs of interproximal calculus. No carious lesions are present. A similar sequence is followed for the other teeth. The most advanced loss of supporting bone is seen in the area of tooth number 14, which also has extruded due to the loss of its antagonist. The alveolar crest is here situated several millimeters apical to the trifurcation, but there still appears to be some bone present in the trifurcation. Residual root tips of the lower first molar are present. The findings of a systematic and thorough retgenographic and clinical examination will provide the needed basis for diagnosis and treatment planning. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.